Today's uh, brown bag seminar in political economy is going to be led by Sean Rittenauer, graduate student in the economics department who everybody knows fairly well, I think. And he's going to be introducing uh, us to a Calvinist revolutionary hero today. <laughs> so, Sean, your work's cut out. All right, thanks. Um, <laughs> that's the... Uh, the, uh, the name of the uh, talk or the discussion as appeared on the schedule is J. Gresham Machen, Calvinist Revolutionary Hero, and um, I think it's an apt, an apt description. Um, the bulk of my discussion, the bulk of my purely biographical information is coming from uh, Ned Stonehouse's biography of Machen, published by Banner of Truth uh, Trust, and featuring a, a, a portrait, a reproduced painting of Machen in his... Uh, academic garb while at Princeton uh, Seminary. Uh, the Dictionary of Christianity in America begins its entry for J. Gresham Machen, describing him as a, quote, Presbyterian clergyman, New Testament scholar, and educator. He was these things to be sure, but he was much more, and in my opinion, he was one of the truly great figures in the 20th century. And my opinion of him uh, elevated uh, every moment I spent preparing this talk. I mean, the more I found out about what he actually said on more and different issues, uh, I liked him better all the time. Uh, John Gresham Machen was born in Baltimore, Maryland on July 28, 1881. His father, Arthur W. Machen, was a successful lawyer whose hobby was collecting the finest editions of available old books and uh, reading classical literature in Latin and Greek. Uh, he subsequently took up Italian after his 80th birthday. Uh, his mother was also a cultured woman who hailed from Macon, Georgia, and during uh, Machen's visit to her home, uh, Machen delivered, uh, developed a sympathy and appreciation for the South uh, and its culture that he felt was disappearing over his uh, lifetime. And in fact, one of the earliest uh, papers that had been saved was a paper he wrote when he was 17 called The Old Homestead, which was a very uh, sympathetic portrait of the homestead from Macon and the, you know, the, 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 the old southern culture of, of, of his mother. Machen was a brilliant man who began his education at a young age in the home. His father encouraged him to read the classics and his mother, uh, mother uh, catechizing him. Um, and he could recite, I guess, the, uh, the shorter catechism at a, at, a, at a very tender age, as he described it in a, an autobiographical sketch that he wrote once. When he was eight, he wrote a letter to his mother telling her how much he liked the history of Alexander the Great, his father had given him. Uh, his former schooling was in private school. Uh, the regular course of study was strongly classical. Uh, Latin was included in the course when he was 12. Uh, Greek was included when he turned 15 and continued throughout the entire course of his studies, uh, of his uh, uh, pre-college studies. Um, out of a total of 86 grades in extant reports over this time, 86 grades that I have reported, he ranked first in his class 78 times. So out of 86 classes, he ranked first in his class 78 times. His marks were consistently in the high 90s, and in the 19 or in the 1895-96 school year, he was given a final grade of 99 in geometry, algebra, Latin, Greek, and natural science, and English, and he made a paltry 97 in French. <laughs> Okay, so that's, is, is, that's right, right. Very bright man. Um, after finishing prep school, he matriculated through John Hopkins University, earning a bachelor's degree and staying on an extra year to take classes from the renowned American classicist Basil L. Gildersleeve. Machen was unsure of exactly what he wanted to do uh, after he graduated from uh, John Hopkins. So after he gra after his graduate year, he considered a career in economics. Uh, interestingly enough. And he took summer school courses in banking and international law at Chicago University. Um, in a letter to his father at that time, he wrote, I'm afraid I'm not going to feel any great enthusiasm for economics and rather feel that my choosing it to study next year is still a remote possibility, uh, though nothing else has come to me yet which seems better. Uh, not unlike my own case early on. Uh, however, light may come during my stay at the university, though I don't feel that way now. So he was kind of unsure. Uh, history, however, reveals that he did reject economics and as a career and subsequently enrolled uh, after encouragement from his family in Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was at Princeton Seminary a strong sense of continuity with the classic Calvinism of people like Charles Hodge and his predecessors. Um, and while at Princeton, Machen studied under Francis Payton and the great B.B. Warfield. 
considered one of the most eminent uh, Calvinist scholars uh, in, of, of all time. Uh, he quickly ran a reputation of being a fine scholar, and he completed a Master's of Philosophy in 1904 from Princeton University while completing uh, the requirements for the Bachelor's of Divinity at the seminary. So he completed a Bachelor's in Divinity at Princeton Seminary and also a Master's degree of Philosophy at Princeton University at the same time. Um, he greatly enjoyed life at Princeton, joining the, what was called the Benham Club, which was ostensibly an eating club, but sort of functioned similar to uh, the Brown Bag uh, Seminar. Uh, right, uh, 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 yeah, a fraternity, uh, not unlike the Brown Bag Seminar. Uh, a former classmate of Machen recorded that in the Benham Club, he, mean Machen, was in his element and at his best. At the club, fines were assessed for breaches of etiquette, and at the end of the year, these fines were collected and the money sent to the Board of Foreign Missions as a contribution from the club. And a poor throw or a bad catch of rolls, for instance, was a fine of one cent. For using the word mister while at the club was ten cents. Uh, for, for talking shop, ten cents. For mentioning the name of a marriageable maiden, 25 cents. <laughs> and uh, for refusing to give a stunt when called upon, 25 cents. Uh, Machen seemed to enjoy nothing more than to be fined and to see others fined. <laughs> uh, and uh, while at Princeton, he also developed a great fondness for football games, a great interest for uh, collegiate sports. And when he later went off to, uh, to serve at the YMCA in Europe during World War One, he wrote letters back to his family pleading for them to at least send the scores because we have no knowledge of any football over here. Um, and it actually kind of criticized the Europeans. You know, one thing, two things that, when, when, when he studied in Germany, two things that the Germans really needed was one, uh, the, two institutions that they needed. One was the Sabbath and second was American football. That's true. That's a good point. I guess at that time they played football on Saturday, I guess. So as long as you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, I guess you're okay. Uh, his knowledge of Greek uh, bode him well in his studies of the New Testament, and that is what probably uh, sent him on his way as a New Testament scholar because of his, uh, his uh, grasp of, of, of Greek. Um, he won the first middle prize in New Testament exegesis for 1903 and 04 uh, at Princeton. And the following year, he was awarded Princeton's New Testament Fellowship for his article, A Critical Discussion on the New Testament Account of the Virgin Birth of Jesus, uh, which was published, uh, and this was rare for this to happen for a student, it was published in succeeding issues in the Princeton Theological Review um, and uh, got a lot of uh, recognition uh, within the next couple of years. The fellowship allowed him to pursue a year of advanced studies on the New Testament in Germany, and um, he, his affection for Princeton was such that he lamented having to leave uh, Princeton, writing uh, to his uh, mother, I think, in a letter, uh, the fellows are in my room now on the last Saturday night, uh, smoking the cigars and eating the oranges, which it has been the greatest delight I ever had to, prov to provide whenever possible. My idea of delight is a Princeton room full of fellows smoking. <laughs> when, I, when I think of what a wonderful aid tobacco is to friendship and Christian patience, I have sometimes regretted that I never began to smoke. <laughs> I know, it's great. It's a little stuff I find about about this guy. Uh, one year later, he returned from Germany to Princeton to become an instructor in the New Testament department and was an instructor from 1906 to 1914. He held this position until his ordination, at which time he came, became assistant professor uh, of the New Testament at Princeton. Um, he did a year of service in the YMCA in Europe during World War I and then devoted three years of study to what is generally considered his great work, The Origin of Paul's Religion, uh, which was published in 1921. After that, and I don't have a copy of that book here, it's, it is in the library. After that came uh, the book Christianity and Liberalism, which was published in 1923, uh, which argued that theological liberalism and historic Christianity were two entirely distinct religions. Uh, Walter Lippmann, in his book Preface to Morals, said of this work that for its acumen, its saliency, and for its wit, this cool, cool and stringent defense of orthodox Protestantism is, I think, the best popular argument produced by either side in the controversy. We shall do well to listen to Dr. Machen's, uh, Machen. The liberals have yet to answer him, and I would argue that they still haven't answered him. Uh, this book crushes uh, his opposition, uh, the opposition that was trying to, to find a, quote, historical, unsupernatural uh, Jesus. And it's interesting, uh, if you, recently I was at Books A Million, I was looking up, like, uh, 
works on historical Christianity. And if you look up look up books by like popular uh, or academic uh, hi- hi- historicists, uh, you find a number of works, uh, particularly like works by guys like Spong, uh, so-called uh, self-proclaimed Bishop Spong, he's been defrauded. And, uh, and and some other historian out of I believe it was Harvard, you know, basically write, something called like the unauthorized history of the New Testament or something. Basically, decrying, you know, look, you know, that the New Testament is not, you know, it's not historically sound. It's not, uh, you know, it's it's uh, we all know that these the, these these the early versions were were not uh, were not good versions of the New Testament. We can't trust the apostles to you know write what really happened. Blah blah blah. And so you look, you quickly look at the index, and they, they don't mention Machen, they don't mes- mention F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, they don't mention E.J. Young. So it's clear that they just don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the scholarship, and they don't speak to any of these issues. So these people that claim that, well, you know, uh, liberalism's here to stay uh, again uh, in 1990 is uh, is basically uh, it's not even scholarship. It's just writings bathed in ignorance. Okay. Now, the, the logic of Machen's opposition to, lib- to theological liberalism led to a confrontation both within, uh, both within Princeton cemetery, uh, cemetery, Seminary, <laughs> sometimes people, it's, it could be looked at as cemetery probably, uh, both with Princeton Seminary and with the Presbyterian Church in the USA, which was his denomination. After a reorganization of the board in 1929 in order to allow a more inclusive theological atmosphere at the seminary, Machen and a number of conservative professors resigned from Princeton Seminary and founded Westminster Theological Seminary, regarded today still as one of the finest academic seminaries in the United States. In 1930, he published another great piece of scholarship entitled The Virgin Birth of Christ, uh, which kind of was flew, uh, uh, grew out of the article that uh, won him the prize, won him the fellowship at Princeton. Um, and this, his book, uh, The Virgin Birth of Christ, defended the historicity of the gospel narrative, and it, again is still considered authoritative on the subject. Um, further struggles in the Presbyterian Church in the USA over liberalism and the Church's missionary corps brought Machen into, contact, uh, into conflict with the darling of the liberals, Pearl S. Buck, and led Machen and some conservative pastors to start up the independent board for Presbyterian foreign missions in 1933. Uh, The denomination didn't like this, and they took action to uh, boot him out uh, of the denomination in 1935. He subsequently founded, along with several more conservative pastors, uh, what became the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And Machen died on January 1st, 1937, of pneumonia. Uh, He developed during a trip to Bismarck, North Dakota, rallying support for the denomination. Now, one of the things that made Machen a truly great figure, in my opinion, was his holding to the classic Reformed theology in that he saw Jesus Christ, the living Son of God, as the Lord of all life, a physical and intellectual, as well as just moral life. And this led him to embrace scholarship and led him to derive from Scripture a profound libertarianism. Uh, He understood that the uh, individual had dignity because it was created in the very image of God. The individual is created in the image of God and therefore has an amount of dignity. He wrote in an article published in the July 1st, 1924 uh, Survey Graphic magazine, quote, It is true that Christianity, as over against certain social tendencies of the present day, insists upon rights of the individual souls. We do not deny that fact. On the contrary, we glory in it. Christianity, if it be true Christianity, must place itself squarely in opposition to the soul-killing collectivism which is threatening to dominate our social life. It must provide the individual soul with a secret place of refuge from the tyranny of psychological experts. It must fight the great battle for liberty of the children of God. The rapidly progressing liberty is one of the most striking phenomena of uh, recent years. I think the rapidly retrogressing liberty is one of the most striking phenomena of recent years. If liberty is to be preserved against the materialistic paternalism of the modern state, there must be something more than courts and legal guarantees. A freedom must be written not merely in the Constitution, but in the people's heart. And it can be written in the heart, we believe, only as a result of the redeeming work of Christ. Machen held the Calvinist doctrine that men in their natural state are totally depraved. The heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it, as it says in Jeremiah? Machen put it this way in his book, uh, The Christian View of Man, um, which was uh, basically a... An edit, collected an edit, edited uh, an edited collection of diff, of uh, radio addresses that he made while at Westminster in the 30s. 
and I think actually published only after he died. He completed these in 1936, I believe. Um, he put, Machen put the, the issue of, of man's fallen nature this way. Thus all mankind through the fall uh, sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden has become corrupt and utterly unable to please God. The individual sins that men commit are but manifestations of that profound corruption of man's nature. The fruit is corrupt because the tree is corrupt. So Machen didn't uh, have a Pollyanni, uh, Pollyannic, I don't know if that's the right word, <laughs> didn't have an overly optimistic view of human nature, in other words. He didn't trust, he wouldn't trust uh, like people in the state, for instance, to make things better. He wouldn't trust Bill Clinton to build that bridge to the 21st century. Um, and it's interesting, I found this quote out of Forum, Forum magazine in 1931. Uh, because of the fallen state, and this is not him, this is me, because of the fallen state of man, the chance of building the kingdom of God on earth via political means is nil. We can't trust politicians because they're fallen individuals. In the Forum magazine article of March of 1931, he wrote, uh, Our comfortable utilitarian world proved not to be so comfortable after all. And this is writing with respect to World War I. <clears throat> in some directions, indeed, there was advance, even in warfare, over conditions that had prevailed before. Antiseptic surgery, no doubt, has accomplished much. But in other directions, there was a marked decline. The notion of the nation in arms, that redoubtable product of the French Revolution, was carried on to something approaching its logical result. Even more logical, and even more damnable, no doubt, will be the results in the next war. And, of course, he didn't live to see you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for instance. Uh, he was I mean, somewhat prophetic. Modern scientific utilitarianism, in other words, did not produce the millennium prior to 1914. And there is not the slightest evidence that it has produced the millennium since that time, or that it will ever produce the millennium in ages to come. Evidently, Bill Clinton has not read much of Machen. Um, we cannot usher in the kingdom of God using the state. We cannot persuade men with a club, was Machen's point of view. We cannot do God's will before we trust him, but we cannot force people into that trust. So it makes no sense to try to force people to be good using the means of the state, because it won't work. Machen was very concerned about expanding the, state in, uh, the expanding uh, statism, statism of his day, and in 1932 and 36. Uh, during those elections, he deserted the Democratic Party because he greatly opposed Roosevelt's <coughs> policies of state advancement. Um, how did Machen's political philosophy then manifest itself in his views on various issues of the day? Well, first, he was no fan of World War I. Um, he didn't like war at all. He hated war. In 1914, Machen was relatively sympathetic to Germany's position during the war, and he wrote in a letter to his mother, uh, quote, the alliance of the Great Britain with Russia and Japan seems to me still an unholy thing, an unscrupulous effort to crush the life out of a progressive commercial rival. Um, imperialism, whether it be British or German, he decried as satanic. Um, immediately before the United States entry into World War I, Machen wrote, quote, the country seems to be rushing into the two things which I am more strongly opposed than anything else in the world, an alliance, a permanent alliance with Great Britain, <laughs> which, which will inevitable, inevitably mean a continuance of the present vassalage and a permanent policy of compulsory military service with all the brutal interference of the state in the individual and family life which that entails. Princeton is a hotbed of patriotic enthusiasm and military ardor which makes me feel like a man without a country. It's pretty wow. strong words to his, to his brother. Sounds like a Georgian opinion. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, he was greatly opposed to the centralization of uh, education in America, and of course he had a great. I mean, he he was he was an educator, and so he felt very passionately about education. On January 12, 1926, in an address before a group called the Sentinels for Freedom in Washington D.C., he stated, "Quote: One of the fundamental principles of liberty which is involved in the present issue is the principles of the right of voluntary association." <laughs> the right of persons to associate themselves voluntarily for the propagation of their own views, however erroneous they might be thought of others in the field of religion or in other spheres. This measure cannot be understood, that is, the measure to create a Federal Department of Education. This measure cannot be understood unless it is viewed in connection with related measures like the so-called Child Labor Amendment or like the Sterling Reed Bill, which provided for federal aid to the states and which really would take away what measure of states' rights we possess. The establishment of a federal department of education would be a step, and a decisive step, in exactly the direction as those measures of which we have just been speaking. Federal aid to education inevitably means federal control. This was in 1926. Um, in February of that same year, Machen testified before the Senate Committee on Education and Labor and the House Committee on Education 
uh, in Washington espousing exactly these same views. And in what could have been a rebuttal of the Chicago school, he testified, quote, People say, you know, that this Federal Department of Education is in the interest of efficiency. Uh, they are always flinging that word efficiency at us as though it, uh, when that word is spoken, all the argument at once is checked. Well, of course, efficiency just means doing things. And I think the important thing to know is whether the things that are being done are good or bad. If the things that are being done by any agency are good, I am in favor of efficiency. But if the things that are being done by the agency are bad, the less efficiency it has, the better it suits me. <laughs> um, uh, Machen was also on record in, op in opposition to, as he put it, the, quote, so-called child labor amendment to the Constitution, which I think was, at that time, was maybe the, the 20th Amendment, I think, at that time. Um, and he, in fact, he wrote an article to uh, the Presbyterian, uh, it was a, a magazine for the Presbyterian Church, entitled The So-Called uh, Child Labor Amendment. Um, letters on, on this subject uh, were published, uh, the letters of his on the subject of his opposition to child labor amendment was published in the New York Herald Tribune and the New York Times within two days of each other. And it was odd, I, I, looking back at like things he's written, it was almost as if he practically had like a quarterly quarterly letter in the New York Herald Tribune. He had like six or seven letters in the span of what's like a couple of years in the New York Herald Tribune. He also had a letter on the subject published in the New Republic uh, opposing um, uh, child labor laws on libertarian grounds. And in an excellent article published in the Presbyterian, he argued against the Presbyterian Department of Temperance and Moral Welfare. He thought that his denomination should become, uh, should not become a political lobby and then points out that the amendment is not about child labor at all, but about increasing the power of the government over the lives of families. Uh, the amendment would have given Congress the power to quote, and this is from the amendment, to limit, regulate, and prohibit the labor of persons 18 years of age. Now, Machen recognized that this language was a legal blank check. If this amendment is adopted, he said, the control of the most intimate details of family life will eventually, in a few decades, if not in a few years, be in the hands of a centralized Washington bureaucracy. And American liberty, with the decencies of the American home, will be gone. Uh, Machen was a great lover of nature, enjoying walks, bicycle rides, and hikes, and mountain climbings, and he didn't have much good to say about what the government was doing with the national park system. <laughs> a letter to the New York Herald Tribune explained, quote, Mount Desert Island, 25 years ago, contained a small but exceedingly beautiful wilderness of mountain and forest like uh, lake and stream. Then came the federal government. A network of carriage roads completed or contemplated is scarring almost every mountainside. At the side of the roads, the forest is being ruthlessly cleaned up until every bit of natural charm is destroyed. Uh, no mossy glen or shady ravine is apparently to be spared. And all this is being done, not in a region which needed the hand of man to make it beautiful, but in one of the most charming lake and mountain districts in the entire east. Must the love of nature be destroyed with government funds? Um, the last specific issue I want to touch upon is Machen's view on prohibition especially considering uh, some past seminars we've had and interest of certain professors here. Uh, <laughs> Machen opposed a prohibition, opposed the, uh, the uh, 18th Amendment, and it cost him plenty in his, uh, in his career and personal life. In the spring of 1926, Princeton Seminary's Board of Directors nominated Machen to be appointed to the chair of apologetics at Princeton Seminary. By this time, however, uh, because of his publications and his views, the liberals in his own denomination had had enough of Machen and were looking for an issue uh, with which to hang him. In May of 1926, the Presbytery of New Brunswick held its assembly at Baltimore. Now, when he was one of the about eight or nine members still there that hadn't left, a resolution was introduced in endorsing the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act. Machen voted no uh, against the resolution, against the endorsement, but... Uh, he did not speak against the resolution. He didn't, he didn't give an address on the, on the subject. And in an, in an irregular move, the Reverend Peter Emmons asked whether he wanted his vote, uh, Machen wanted his vote recorded, and Machen said he did not. Nevertheless, wide publicity was given to Machen's vote, and it was interpreted and used by his enemies to paint Machen as having a loose and evil attitude towards temperance, uh, temperance and even drunkenness itself. Now, falsehoods uh, began to spread that he was wet or even a drunkard. Uh, so, you know, Machen's a drunk. <laughs> and it was uh, most often stated. Uh, it was most often stated that the Machen family money was made in the brewery business, oh, and that he continued to depend on it for a source of income. And none of these reports have any shred of truth. Um, and uh, Stonehouse uh, does a great job uh, 
was allowed by the family to look at the financial documents and the wills of and the financial statements of the major family and, and you know found that not as you know they've never got any money never owned any stock in any brewery company whatsoever um Machen did not think prohibition was a wise policy because he disliked centralized government. He was also opposed to the church's entry into the political field in accordance with the uh, Southern Presbyterian emphasis on limited scope of the church's functions. His family's background was hardly prohibitionist. Uh, there's a letter talking about how glad his, happy his dad was to be able to bring out the Madeira to serve to his guests at one of his parties with all these, you know, these these Greek and Latin speakers that he you know, hung out with. Um, and uh, Mason himself was not con uh, did not consider uh, total abstinence to be uh, correct as a principle because he did not think that Scripture warranted a total abstinence position on alcohol. Um, he was he once wrote his mother that he was vigorously opposed to the efforts of William Jennings Bryan in behalf of a Presbyterian assembly deliverance on the issue because he felt that it only served to obscure the gospel and distract people from what the church was about. However, he himself virtually practiced total abstinence, at least during his ministerial career. I mean, he didn't he just he didn't drink. Um, and as one as and as uh, Stonehouse put it, um, unfortunately, commitment to the biblical principle of temperance or moderation, as distinguished from total abstinence, is identified by some persons with license, and no allowance is made for the possibility that the, that the defender of Christian liberty may consistently refrain from the exercise of that liberty. And that, that happens all the time. still happening today. Um, with the help of these attacks, the liberals in the General Assembly overturned Machen's chairship and subsequently began an investigation into the sem seminary itself, which ultimately led to the liberal reorganization of the seminary, of the board of the directors, rather, and with Machen and his people leaving and founding Westminster. Um, Machen's legacy is one that I think all of us should aspire to. Uh, he was a great Christian, a great scholar, a great theologian, and a great libertarian, uh, respected, if not always agreed with, by most of those he ran across. Even writers whose viewpoints were antithetical to his own, including Pearl Buck and the Unitarian Albert uh, Diefenbach, or Diefenbach, uh, acknowledged that he stood head and shoulders above his contemporaries in strength of character and fidelity to principle. On Machen's death, H.L. Mencken, who was no fan of conservative Christianity, uh, wrote that, quote, though I could not yield to his reasoning, I could at least admire, and did greatly admire, his remarkable clarity and cogency as an apologist, allowing him his primary assumptions. Yeah, I know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Uh, J. Gresham Machen was a fine example of a conservative Calvinist whose views led him to embrace a libertarian political philosophy. Wow, oh, thank you very much. The uh, the margin there, though, that it, it seems to be a tricky margin where you're, where Machen is advocating that the church itself not become political, and yet at the same time he's obviously very active and feeling compelled himself to political commentary, uh, and in some cases uh, testifying. Before, before Congress. That's kind of a tricky line to walk, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I, As a I, representative it, of the church. It, it, right. I mean, it could, yes, very well be. You just have to make sure that you're split, you know, you make sure that you're not speaking for the church. You know, I'm not speaking as a citizen. And that the church preach correctly on, say, moral and social issues. And then the citizens should uh, be sanctified enough to make what would be correct biblical decisions in the, in the voting booth. Put that one. Uh, yes. What's your opinion on the following? Because you certainly know more about the arguments than I ever will. It seems to me a misnomer to say that you do not want the church to be political in the following sense. I mean, I think they put the first commandment first for a reason. You know, we never sort of want to say, you know, you shouldn't have any other gods before me. Well, constantly we're trying to replace God with the state. Now, it seems to be that's the heart of his argument there, mm -hmm. is it's not necessarily trying to politicize the church, but the church understanding its role is, listen, folks, if you, you know, want to jettison faith in God, markets, whatever you want to call it, you're going down the path of the hammer and sickle, basically. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's I generally Was he ever that. explicit about um, it? Like I have not found him, I've never, I haven't found anything that, I haven't like found like a, an article, or I have not read nearly as hardly you know nearly every, anything that he, everything is written. So I mean, there could be 
and I'm sure there's probably articles in the Presbyterian where he wrote on the subject. He, he did his, he had a couple articles. One was called, uh, Does Fundamentalism Retard Social Progress? One was uh, Christianity and Liberty, and one was uh, the responsibility of the church in our new age. Okay. Not to be confused with the new age of the 1980s and 90s. <laughs> Um, and those three articles basically carry the same theme that he didn't explicitly come out and say, talk about replacing God with a, a little g God like the state. Um, but that's, it seemed to me as that's, an, that's an implication throughout his entire thing. Basically, and also that it's very dangerous to put our faith and trust in infallible human beings and give them the power to paternally direct our lives. But he never came out explicitly, and he never really, he never wrote anything explicitly, of like a explicit political uh, tract explaining his philosophy on political matters either. These are all kind of just, you know, articles about a certain issue that mm -hmm. came up. What, what do you think he would stand on on uh, this idea that that politicians should should deliver stump speeches from pulpits like we see all the time today? Oh, I think it would be. I think he'd be greatly opposed to that. I think that uh, he is, his view is that the, 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 the uh, function of the church is to glorify God. And uh, the chief end of man is glorify, we glorify God and enjoy him forever. I think that's what the first answer to the short catechism said. And, and he explicitly, I mean, he believes that heart and soul. And so he thinks that, it, that this politicizing that goes on, like stump speaking in, from church pulpits, is just an abuse, uh, you know, a radical abuse of, uh, of the pulpit. Uh, the, the, the church has no business, the church's business is to preach the gospel, to preach the, the word of God. And it's not, it's no business, uh, you know, giving a forum for particular political causes. My guess is that he would probably see it the same way that we'd see uh, someone make a stump or some car dealership in the pulpits. You know, the service or something. Right, yeah, or any, 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 even like a, a lecture on, I don't know, a lecture on uh, on economics from the pulpit. It's, it's just, it's inappropriate. At, at best, it's just not the time, the way to do it. You know, uh, your talk brings back a lot of memories because my grandfather uh, on the mother's side, who was a missionary to, uh, a medical missionary to Korea, was involved in that very same thing about uh, uh, forming an independent board. Oh, really? Yeah, he was, uh, he was a missionary He's in Korea at the time, and a member uh, of uh, the uh, United Presbyterian Church, and very much a contemporary uh, of major. And uh, the problem they were having was that the ja you know, they were under Japanese occupation. The Japanese were trying to force them to uh, bow down to, shrine, to the Shinto shrines. And, uh, and they held out, and the United Presbyterian Church ordered them to go ahead and bow down to the shrines because it doesn't mean very much. And that was one of the huge issues that led to the uh, forming of the independent board. It was, more, it was, um, it was not the issue, obviously, but it was one. It was basically, you know, that the, the straw that broke the camel's back. That was the last of, of the. And uh, a number of them, with my grandfather, were defrocked mm. uh, as a result of this. Mm. And when I was young, my grand, my father telling me, you know, that. Yeah, this church to frock people like Jay Gresham Major and you know and uh, uh, name some others. He says that you know tell you everything you need to know about them. But even to this day, I will not be a member of. I would never be a member of that particular denomination. Mm. You know, out of uh, dishonor to my grandfather. Yeah. You use the word liberalism several times, right. and can you clarify yeah. what his opponents? You know what they believe theologically. Well, okay, they uh, he liberals. he would he would say that the liberals tended to take a very experiential ex experiential view of religion and and say that we should draw our Christianity was an, an ethic basically taken out of the Sermon on the Mount and that the the, the hardcore liberals even said that you know, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God he never asked for and never and always refused the worship of men. That uh, basically, it's you know Jesus was fine, but then along came Paul and spoiled all. It was Paul that attached you know the God's uh, you know the, the notion that Jesus Christ was was the Son of the Living God. And it, you know the, the, he, the, the liberal claim is that Jesus never made those claims. That Jesus was a, maybe an enlightened man. He was a great ethicist, but that he wasn't really the Son of God. And that if we study the Gospels. 
historically, we find that, yes, it's just this, it's this uh, unsupernatural Jesus that we're talking about that was speaking about the kingdom of God on earth and how we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Machen points out, and, and, and this, again, as Christian Elmer is such a good book, he points out that it's just not true, that if you look at the documents, if you look at what Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, they're very, they're very high, they're, they're big linchpin of their whole argument. In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus was making claims for his, for his God, for his being God, and claims are unmistakable, particularly to the Jewish people to whom he was speaking. And, um, Part and parcel with liberalism is denying that Jesus was really born of a virgin, that uh, he really was resurrected from the dead, um, things like that. And de denying that certain parts of the scripture was, was inspired, infallible word of God. So who, so Fong is a modern day exponent well, of his view? Uh, probably to the nth degree, <laughs> I would say. Um, but H Harry Fosdick was a very influential liberal at the time. And Henry Van Dyke, who was a friend of Machen's, wrote a virulent letter attacking Machen uh, and attacking Machen's views and left, basically decided he was leaving the church because Machen was still in the pulpit. And, and uh, the, the Harry, Henry Van Dyke wrote the text, To Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, which if you read it, you can see that you can see the liberalism that has crept into that hymn, which makes me not like it as much as I used to. But... Um, um, I, th I think it's important to point out that a, a primary tenet of liberalism, theological liberalism, this is in Protestant Christianity, is the denial that the Bible, the Scripture, um, that you can derive doctrine for current situations in any way from Scripture from the Bible. Right, um, that's there true. Is a, there is a middle ground, so to speak, of people who are not literalists and yet still believe. That, what you, that the Bible is the central tenet for the Protestant faith and drawing the doctrine that's what the so-called New Orthodox uh, tradition, which is very strong in the form, in a continental reform, and to the extent Presbyterian churches as well. So liberalism really denied that you could even do that. This document was good for back then. It's not any good for now, basically. Yeah, I would say that. Everything has to be derived from experience, not... Not only that experience is good, but that it's all you can really rely on. Right, <laughs> and, and the seduction of the liberalism was that they still use the same language. Right. They still use the same language. They talked about, well, the, and, and some of the liberals, liberals of the time said, well, the, the Bible contains the Word of God, or contains what we think is the Word of God, but they don't, that, that's not the same thing as saying it is the Word of God. You know? and so that they, they talked about, well, we're Christians, meaning that we believe in doing what's right, basically. That kind of thing. They, they use the same, it's what uh, Francis Schaeffer called, using God talk or God speak, that they used the Christian language, but the definitions were completely changed. Um, so taxes are now contributions, that kind of thing. Does, does he draw a connection between theological liberalism and statism in this book? Uh, slightly, but it's hardly... I mean, he, 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 he points out that, yeah, I mean, in the sense that it's the theological liberals that are getting about to expanding the state because we're wanting to solve our problems with the state. We have grave problems, uh, not in this book necessarily, but in like in the, thir the 30s when he's writing, in the midst of the Depression. And in, in this book, the first, the first address was on, well, why am I talking about God? Why am I spending radio time talking about God and not the NRA or not you know, the unemployment crisis or whatever? And his, his point is that, look, uh, the world is not all material. And we can't solve our crisis. Our crisis is deep down inside a, a moral crisis, and we can't solve our problems by using fix-it government schemes. That we need people. We, it's only by the Holy Spirit working in our lives as a result of us, you know, receiving Jesus as our Savior, that and, and having faith in Christ. That is what will turn our crisis around. And so he sees that liberalism that rejects that leaves us in an abyss of well, what else are we going to do if we can't if we, if we can't be truly sanctified as individuals by, um, by, you know, by the blood of Christ by the Holy Spirit then what are we left with? we're left with some forms of materialist uh, response and I think Machen felt that um, that the utilitarian the secular utilitarianism had led to a tendency of you know Finding out well what would be the greatest good for the greatest people, and to do that thing, and which led you know allowed statism kind of the mill. It's like mill allowed statism in the back door, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Do you get the sense that uh, he adhered to um, classical liberalism, or was it just a pragmatic case by case scenario with respect to uh, 
political liberalism, yeah, yeah. not the, the Christian liberalism. Yeah, I, uh, I think he, he, given his education, he must have been familiar with that tradition. Yeah, um, he, the, 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 the what am I trying to say? The impression I got was that um, he was ge- he was generally opposed to government intervention on all issues. I mean, and he was asked that point blank from one of the congressmen that, at the committee. He said, well, "What's your general view of these things?" And he says, "I'm generally view of all statist or all centralized forms of activity enter- in entering in- encroaching upon uh, you know the rights of individuals." Um, but he was very clear to write on things and speak on things that he felt he knew something about. There were some issues that people wanted him to speak about at, during the, during his day um, that he refused to write an article about because he just didn't feel qualified. He felt qualified to speak on education because he was an educator. He felt qualified to speak on, say, the natural park system because he was in nature so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and those types of things. Um, and some of these quotes that I gave him were, were not were from letters. Um, so like his his art his stuff about his what he wrote about World War One, for instance, was in personal correspondence, wasn't published. Um, so it, it it seems so. I mean, he 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 never. There's no indication he never cited you know in any of these things great uh, you know classical liberal authors or anything like that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think part of that. I don't know exactly if that was because he just didn't. It's clear that he had an overarching political philosophy, but uh, the nature of the way he was, he just he didn't want to overstep his bounds mm-hmm. and, and speak on issues that weren't you know, under his thing. I don't I don't know how to answer that. I don't know. Well, I mean, it's it's a, it's a complex question because what you, from what little we know uh, of his <clears throat> theological views, it seems like you could, you know, there's a there's a connection there. I mean, you know the, the theological views sort of uh, require that uh, people do things on their own and that they have uh, a domain to to act under. Essentially. Right, right. And then if this if central government is controlling something, then that um, takes those issues or those actions out of our domain. Right. He very much was interested in the right of freedom to assembly, for instance, and felt that. Um, he believed he ar- he wrote an, a letter arguing against I think a law in Nebraska which made it illegal to teach foreign languages to children until they're like 16 or something like that and felt that you know that was that's just I mean, that's just basically re- not allowing them to have a classical education because they'll never pick up these languages that, like they need to at when since they're so old. He also oppo- and so he opposed that um, and he said it also he felt violated the right to. I don't know if it was a free speech issue. There's a free speech issue in another state, like in Oregon or New York. The Lusk laws made it mandatory that all all private institutions be licensed by the state, not not just public, but private you know, private institutions. And he felt that was a violation of of these institutions' rights, um, both on on assemb- right to assembly grounds and also on free speech. But he said he was not he was not in favor of I think the Phi Beta Kappa Society was wanting to preach kind of like one of these uh, a radical free speech code, so that that you have you had to be inclusive of all speech, that there was no speech that was not permi- uh, uh, unpermitted or uh, should be censored in any way, that were for the free flow of ideas. And Machen uh, was, you know, argued against that be, you know, because say, well, look, we're a private institution and we have to have the right to exclude people. That are um, you know uh, that we don't agree with that are say atheists for instance we we, we don't want an atheist on our faculty so we want to have the right to exclude them okay something like that I'm curious uh, you said he was in um, Germany during World War One and uh, obviously he, he uh, saw problems with that did he write specifically at all about what was happening in terms of the forming of Soviet Union and socialism coming to a rise? No, he didn't write about that in any. Re- I mean, he just references here and there to the bureaucratization in Russia, and I mean, it's clear he didn't like what was going on there. He thought that uh, all individualism and, and, and liberty was being being crushed there, but he didn't he didn't really write much what was actually going on or anything. I mean, there's a great there's a great account of his. He was he worked with the YMCA in uh, in 
in uh, Germany, which at that time was still the Young Men's Christian Association. It wasn't like some health club now that, that you know you can get cheap rooms at or something like that. I mean, they're out. They're basically kind of like a USO thing, only was but it was only more international. Or, uh, and he was working uh, with French troops, you know, running as he said, like a, ineptly trying to run a small delicatessen to like give, I guess, cheap food food to the troops and stuff. And there's a great letter that he wrote. Uh, the wash, doing laundry here is great. It makes your clothes wet, but it doesn't do much for getting them clean. He hadn't had a bath in like several weeks, and he said that... This um, is when he was in France. Yeah, he wow. said... He said <laughs> yeah, 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 it's typical, I suppose. And he said that the underwear in France are cut very peculiarly. <laughs> and he's, he's having trouble with his underwear because he didn't like the way they were cut. It's really weird. But um, anyway, so he sent this letter, like a four-page letter, and then... His parents stopped telling him, submitted it to the Baltimore Sun. Of course, it got printed immediately in the Baltimore Sun. And he felt kind of bad because he, he thought that the, the YMCA should have, you know, he should have got permission from them before printing anything. But I didn't have time to go into that. But it was really fascinating, interesting stuff. It was actually, he, he would not go in, he didn't want to go to into military service because he was opposed to that. He didn't. Um, in fact, there was some concern about even going over there in the YMCA that, once they got over there, they may be co-opted and have to carry munitions from one part, one one point to the next. And he was he didn't he was concerned about that. And only after he was assured by like the national director that we would have no part in that, that he went ahead and, and, and took the year appointment. Was he opposed to all war whatsoever? Or was it just this particular war? No, I don't think so. It, um, it wasn't. It, he didn't like war. But that didn't. I don't think he was opposed to it because even in conscription, he said that I'm opposed to inscription, except perhaps in the case of um, a national an invasion of our country. So I mean, he was he wasn't against. He wouldn't be for like standing in Baltimore and letting the the Ruskies run over him or something like that. I mean, it was it was. I think the nature of this of, of this type of war and this basically, I think he is his the real enemy was imperialism and the war that was growing out of this imperialistic fervor. That was the pre-Lincoln philosophy. Right, right. More of kind of a just war type of philosophy. You know, in in terms of the overall big picture here, um, in in Macon's role and in the timing of his you know role at the Princeton Seminary and, and so on, uh, would you consider him? More or less, the last of the old guard in this in, in the Princeton theological seminary religion, and so on, or was he somebody who made new advances and broke out in new directions, and it just happened to be at the end of in, in the turning over to liberalism uh, at this point in time? Um, in terms of the, the theology, in terms of the, theology. Um, well, no, I don't think I don't think he considered himself making any new. I mean, I, I guess I don't think he make he felt himself was making any new uh, additions. He was Charles Hodge was fond, uh, who was the, the 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 head of the seminary, like a generation before, was fond of saying that, uh, uh, and uh, an original argument has never came out of Princeton Seminary, and we're proud of it because we're holding to the the old Calvinism. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, in that respect, the the the, the third, uh, the second adjective, revolutionary, is probably not really apropos. He's maybe reactionary would be a better term. That he was reacting against what he saw as this unbiblical encroachments of liberalism, mm -hmm. and he was trying to hold the fort. And he was, I mean, he and a handful <coughs> of hardcore seminarians were the only intellectual, I'd say, intellectual Christians that were holding the fort at that time. And I, I used to think, well, you know, Machen's gone and that's it. But, I mean, people like Sinclair Ferguson and other writers of, he is clearly, I mean, beyond just his position on scripture, was clearly a monumental scholar. I, mean, I was reading his book and just felt like a, like a, you know, like a goof. <laughs> like, you know, what am I doing, you know? Uh, just because he's so, he, he knew so much and wrote so well and, uh, you just just a great guy, Cause and because at, at this time, most of the divinity schools and, and seminaries had already fallen. Basically, this was was Princeton. Like I think they were kind of like the last of the well, them and fall. them, and you had the dispensation was Dallas Seminary that was kind of starting up, which is conservative and has produced probably some okay stuff. I mean, in terms of like biblical exegesis mm -hmm. or biblical say historical stuff. 
but they have a different way of approaching certain parts of scripture, which I'm not. I'm becoming less and less fond of. But uh, Princeton, I mean, Princeton, the Princeton. I mean, there's definitely when Machen left Princeton, that was they pretty much. I mean, you can see that the I mean, the Princeton Theological Seminary. I, I think they went downhill. But Westminster is continue. I mean, still looked upon as a fine, you know, high level academic uh, Calvinistic uh, seminary. And again, you still have people that high level people coming out of there. Now you probably don't have people. Probably not the, quite the quality of Machen, but mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely think Machen had a kind of approach not only to theology but to culture that is no longer with us. I mean, his he was very much a gentleman. He was very much a, his family is a cultured family, a classically educated family, and you don't see that much nowadays. Even amongst, I mean, you probably wouldn't find somebody like like that at, at Westminster. Okay, well. Um, there was also, I want to point out, there was there's a seminary in Virginia, Union Theological, that kind true. of took the conservative man after, after. That's true. You're America, right. So Union liberal. So now they're actually facing the same problems that Princeton did. Right, right. So you're right. I forgot about that. Liberal attacks, so to speak. Okay, well, speaking of high standards, John, we thank you for the, uh, for the summary. Thanks. Thanks.